Good morning. Good morning. All right, see if y'all were awake. Good to see everybody. I hope everybody that uh, wanted to build a snowman got an opportunity and got it done. If you missed it, I hate that. Um, it's good to see all our college students in, military, and I see these young people, and they're grown up, and they're adults, and man, it makes me feel old. AJ come in here this morning with them military blues on. I was thinking about pictures of him when he was playing on the playground as a little kid, you know. It just, uh, they're going to grow up. I want to make an announcement that uh, Ty made it last week. Ty's here by the, today, by the way. He's sitting back there somewhere. But uh, next Sunday night, not not this Sunday night, the next Sunday night, we'll start children's church and teen church right down here on these first four or five pews or whatever it takes. Uh, so if you come in next Sunday night for children's church, instead of bringing them over to the multipurpose building, bring them down here for the first ten minutes. And and uh, I hope everybody can be here for that. And uh, we're going to kick that off after the first of the year. And... Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. I think you'll enjoy it. There's a uh, there's a fictitious story that I heard about these two old men that were friends, friends for years and years, decades, and uh, one of them was deathly ill, lived way on into their 90s, and his friend comes to see him and visit him on his deathbed, and they're reminiscing about old times and talking about their friendship and all they'd done together and everything. And he said to him, he said, you know, he said, I've always wanted to know one thing. He said, is there baseball in heaven? And uh, he said, I've always wondered about that. And uh, anyway, a couple days later, his friend died and the uh, man who had come to visit him went on with life. A few days after that, he was taking a nap, and he, and he had this dream. And in his dream, he heard this voice talking to him. He said, I've got some good news and some bad news. He said, good news is there's baseball in heaven, but the bad news is you're pitching on Wednesday. You know, we think about, I, I know that's a silly story. I know what he is, and that's why I told it. But we don't know. We don't know in this life how much time that we have. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. About how much time that we have and what we do with that time that we have. How do we use it? Psalm chapter 90. If you're following along in the scriptures, Psalm chapter 90, we'll start at verse 10. The days of our lives are 70 years, and by reason of strength they may be 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger, for as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. You know, it's interesting there that the psalmist writes that the normal lifespan, as I understand it, is 70 years. And I know many of you who are far beyond that. More power to you. It says if we're stronger, we'll live longer than that. So if you live longer than 70 years, you're pretty strong. If you live 100 years, you're really strong. And I've had some people in my life that I've been fortunate enough to know that have lived a hundred years. Um, but one day, it's going to be all over. One day we're going to come to our last day. Verse 12 says, teach us to number our days. 
teach us to know how to manage our time. Do we manage our time? Do we make the most of it? Every day in our life counts. Do we use it wisely? You know, if you're always battling getting older, you're going to always be unhappy because it's going to happen anyway. It's just going to happen. It is inevitable that we're all going to get older. There's 168 hours in the week. I think I calculated that right. If I didn't, I'm going to be in bad shape. Some teachers in here probably adding that up right now. <laughs> made a mistake. 168 hours in a week. And there was a study that I come across. It's been a number of years ago since it was done. And it said this is how the average person, 18 years old or older, spends their time. 53 hours sleeping. Well, that's average. I don't get that much sleeping. 26 hours working. And you're probably sitting there thinking, wait a minute, boy, I wish I could work 26 hours. Now, we're talking about people who are retired and all people in all walks of life who are surveyed. So the average is 26 hours. Eight hours eating. You adding that up? Y'all keep up now. 51.9 hours watching TV, radio, and other forms of media. 1.3 hours listening to some sort of music. I know there's some people in here that listen to a lot more than that. I guess you could be doing something else too. 3.3 hours reading magazines, articles, and that sort of thing. 18 minutes involved in some sort of exercise. I, that's a little much for me. Uh, 18 minutes, that's not long to be physically involved in exercise. I don't even know if you can get your, can you get your heart rate up in 18 minutes? Anyway, 12 minutes reading books, 24 hours doing all sorts of other miscellaneous things. That should add up pretty close to 168 hours. It'd be interesting for us to do that. And I don't know if I could make it through a week and keep up with all my time, and I'm sure that one week would obviously differ from another. This last week would be very unusual, of course. But uh, I assume that that 12 minutes reading books would include the Bible. That's not much. That's every book. That's not much time spent studying. Surely a Christian can do more than that. But do we waste our time? You know, sometimes I think that my idea of wasting time is obviously different than other people's idea of wasting time. What you think of wasting time probably going to be different than what I do. And we know that a lot of times we may think of things like interacting with other people, building relationships. Some of us may at times wonder if that's a good use of time. But it is. It is. Proverbs chapter 16. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2 and 3. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the Spirit. Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. No time spent doing the Lord's work is wasted. No time spent serving others is wasted. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 1 says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Now you can debate on what that scripture means. And uh, I'm not going to do that this morning. But I think to me, I think about it in these terms. We don't always see immediate responses to those things we do. When we go out into the world and we plant the seed of the gospel 
to those around us and those that we live with every day. Sometimes we think that we ought to see some change in them instantly. It don't work like that. It don't work like that. Have you ever planted a garden and then you went out there four or five days later or a week later to see if you had any seed coming up? You know? You have to wait on things. You have to be patient. They say patience is a virtue. And I think that's a virtue that's learned over time. In 2 Kings chapter 20, there's a king named Hezekiah. And if you have a Bible, I'd like for you to turn with me there this morning. 2 Kings chapter 20, we'll read the first six verses of that. This king Hezekiah, I think, I think he was a pretty good king. At least history tells us that he was a pretty good king. But Hezekiah, it was very, he was in a very unusual situation. He's in a situation that I know of no other person in the scriptures that I can for sure this happened to them exactly the same way that it did Hezekiah. In Hezekiah's story in 2 Kings chapter 20, start with verse 1, in those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. When I read that scripture, I understand that I, I really understand that Hezekiah was being told, you better get it together. I'm telling you, you better get it together because your end is upon you. It is inevitable. And I'm telling you so you'll know. Verse 2, then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and I have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He knew he was going to die. He knew that this was it, that his race was run. That he was finished. So many people in this world, most of us would never know that. So many people are here today and gone tomorrow and there's no warning. There's no warning to what can happen to us. Verse 4, And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days fifteen years. Wouldn't that be something? Don't you just know that Hezekiah thought, Praise the Lord! I've got 15 more years. He had 15 more years. He was assured of that. God was giving it to him. And he told him that he was giving it to him. Now, you and I don't have that. We don't have anything but today. We don't have assurance that we have tomorrow or even this afternoon. We know that we are not going to be told by what our last day is or we're very likely not going to be, at least by God anyway. That's probably the way that it should be. But I want you to think about it. I want you to think about that this morning. Think about time. Think about the use of your time. 
sit down and look at the natural lifespan of a person. Think about the time that we spend getting ourselves educated so that we can make a living. Sometimes it usually starts around four or five years old and it ends somewhere normally 20s, sometimes even later in life. But say you spend the average of uh, 22 years preparing yourself to work the rest of your life. And compare that to the amount of time that you spend preparing for eternity. You might spend a third of your life getting ready for the next two-thirds of your life. But how much time do we spend getting ready for eternity? How much time do we spend getting to know God's plan for us? How much time do we spend getting to know His Word? Twelve minutes a week? Think about it. How do we spend our time? How we spend our time tells everyone around us what is important to us. It's our priorities in life. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 7 and 8. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. We need to be fervent. We need to plan for our eternity. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 35 and 36, Jesus said, and he said in Matthew chapter 24, starting with verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but my Father only. We don't know. We don't know how long we're going to be here. We don't know how long this world is going to be here. Oh, sure, there's a lot of people speculating on that. Some of them have made a livelihood out of speculating on that. Watch TV a little bit. Watch a few of those documentary channels. You'll find out that there's some people that spend a lot of time and effort talking about that. I've got one more thought for you, and then the lesson is yours. Your bulletin this week, if you picked up one on the front page, I hope you'll take this home and slap that thing up on your refrigerator. Every few days when you walk by, look it over. If you didn't pick up a bulletin, you can get one on the way out. There's a little article there by a guy named Thomas Hooten. It's been around a long time, but I thought it might be fitting for today's bulletin. He talks about New Year's resolutions. You know, I'm always going to lose a little bit of weight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that this year, I think. You know, I lose 40 pounds and somebody says, hey, yeah, you, might, you might be losing some weight. Gained 40 pounds and says, hey, you gained some weight? You know, we always make New Year's resolutions, and most of the time we don't keep them. Most of the time we're going to do a better job of this or a better job of that or whatever it is. That we're not comfortable in ourselves and how we're doing it or how we're living. But let's look at these eight things. Number one, study God's Word daily. Now, there's your resolution. Number two, be in Bible study every Sunday. Number three, worship God in spirit and truth. 
you say, well, I, I do that. I mean really. I mean really. I don't mean going through the motions. I mean when you pray, pray intentionally and fervently. True worship, true reverence to God, true interest, getting to know Him better and glorifying Him. Partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. I can't stress how important that is. Paul says we need to examine ourselves when we partake of the Lord's Supper. We need to look at ourselves in the light of what Christ wants us to be. That great sacrifice that he made for us in going to the cross and dying on that cross for us to have an opportunity to live with him for eternity when time is no more. That Lord's Supper should remind us who we are, who we belong to. It should remind us of that time when we made Christ our Lord and Savior, when we repented of our sins, when we confessed Him as our Lord, when we were baptized into His death, and when we came out of that water having been forgiven our sins through that watery baptism. The Lord's Supper ought to remind us of that. We ought to be thinking about that. We ought to understand that. We ought to examine ourselves and see if it's still there. Do I still have it? And if we don't, if it's starting to grow cold, you better do something about that zeal. You better do something about it quick. Because apathy is the biggest problem in the church today. When you stop caring. Give as you prosper. Give to God's work. Give as you prosper. It's what God expects of us. Develop a mind of servanthood. Now there's a big one. Do I serve? Am I active? Do I try to get involved? Do I have the attitude that I'm going to use my time this year to make a difference, whether it's in a child's life or in a shut-in's life or a nursing home patient's life or in somebody's life that's down, somebody that needs encouragement? And I'm going to do that at my expense. That's servanthood. Do we have that? Are you listening? Do we have that in our lives? Live so that Christ, so that others can see Christ in us. Number nine, or number seven. Live so that others can see Christ in us. I had a good friend told me one time, he said, if I was out there and uh, I was going down the road and there was somebody sitting out there shooting Christians, sitting on the side of the road, there's a Christian, got him. He said, you know, and he, he's Christian, faithful. He said, sometimes I feel like they might have a little bit of trouble identifying me. They'd have to stop and look. You know how those of you that deer hunt, now you've got to look and see if they got enough horn to make sure they're legal. He said that. He gave me that example. I thought a lot about that. Do other people, I'm not talking about in this room. I'm talking about in this world that you live in, that you function in, that you make your living in that you work in and play in and 
you go about your daily lives in every day, do they see you as someone who's in Christ? When they think of you, do they think of someone who is devoted to the Lord? If not, if they don't see me that way, I've got problems as a Christian. If I can't be seen by those around me as someone who is without a doubt, without a doubt, put Christ number one in my life, I've got problems as a Christian. I've got my priorities out of order. I'm not using my time the way I ought to be using my time. Last, number eight. For each of us should live so that if this is the last day on earth, it would be the first day in heaven. Think about that. If today, if you and I walk out of this building, And for some reason, unbeknownst to us, this is the day we step out into eternity. Are you ready? Think about it. Because a New Year's resolution that has to do with you doing better in your life when your life is not right with God is a secondary New Year's resolution. And if you hadn't put on Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you've been doing that New Year's resolution for the last few years to do that, there's no better time than now. We'll offer invitation. If you need to, or if you have a need, if you need the prayers of this assembly, if there's anything we can do for you, won't you come down front as we stand and sing the invitation song?